Hello, everyone. I think we're going to get started. I know some more participants are still arriving. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Happy World Water Day. Uh, my name is Marlo Campbell, and I'm the Communications Director at the Lake Winnipeg Foundation. I am also going to be your host and facilitator for today's event. Um, thank you for joining us today on World Water Day. I want to start by acknowledging that Lake Winnipeg is part of the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota, and Métis. And it's a lake that's long been cared for by the people on its shores. And I'm proud to be part of a community that's continuing that tradition of care. Some housekeeping for those of you joining us today. Uh, the microphones and cameras for you are disabled and the chat function has also been disabled. So you'll be in listen only and watch only mode for the duration of today's webinar. In terms of format, we are going to spend some time today introducing you to this federal position paper. We're going to talk through each of the five recommendations and we're gonna do that a little differently. We're gonna do that through good old conversation. So we're not going to do a PowerPoint. Um, we are going to have, have a discussion. So I'll be asking our two speakers some questions to facilitate that discussion. Um, and if you have questions, and we hope that you do, we're asking you please to use the Q&A function in this Zoom webinar. So you'll find that at the bottom of your screen. We'll be making time a little bit later in the hour to answer as many of your questions as we can. Um, of course, through our conversation, some of your questions may be answered. Um, and so uh, if your question are answered, or if you would like to see the questions that have been answered, again, if you use the Q&A feature and you click on the all questions bar, you'll be able to see some of the questions um, that have been answered as we go along. We'll be running a few polls to hear your opinions today. Uh, a reminder that uh, polls are anonymous, so you can be as honest as you would like. And speaking of your opinions, we will also send out a short feedback survey after this event, um, just to learn how we did and how we can improve. And finally, to let you all know that this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available to watch later on on our YouTube channel. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to our two speakers. So we've got Alexis Canoe here. She is the Executive Director of the Lake Winnipeg Foundation. Alexis received her doctorate in environmental science from the University of Manitoba and has extensive experience working with diverse organizations in both the nonprofit and community development sectors. Alexis is passionate about building healthy connections between people and the environment. And joining her is Daniel Gladukanu, who is the director of the Lake Winnipeg Indigenous Collective. He is Anishinaabe, Métis and Irish, and a member of the Anamake Wazing First Nation. Daniel was born in Fort Francis, Ontario, and has a Bachelor of Science Honours in Biology from the University of Winnipeg, as well as years of experience in project management, research, and community development. He is an advocate for Indigenous self-determination and resurgence, especially in relation to water governance and food systems. Both Daniel and Alexis live in Winnipeg, in Treaty 1 territory, and a fun fact, they are married to each other and have two children. So welcome to you both. Now, we want to get in on this uh, topic, but before we do, let's try a poll. Let's run a poll here. So uh, you're going to see a poll question appear on your screen. And again, your answer will be anonymous if you want to um, click one of the answers. Have you ever reached out to an elected official to advocate for change? Yes, many times. Yes, once. No, but I'd like to. Or no, because it's pointless. Um, so I'll give you just another moment or two uh, to select your answer. And let's see the answers. Let's see the breakdown. Okay, so it's a, it's a good breakdown. We've got 43% uh, say yes many times, and I'll do it again. I'll rally my friends and family and colleagues. We have some folks who have tried it once, um, some who haven't, and we've got a few cynics on this call, which is great. Should make for a, a fun discussion later on when we get to some questions and answers. Uh, and speaking of discussion, let's start that now. Um, and I want to start, Alexis, with you, um, just to introduce uh, the paper and introduce the, the ideas that we're going to be talking about. So I think it's fair to say that there's always a role for, for all governments when it comes to the health of Lake you know, of Lake Winnipeg. Uh, when I think municipal, of course, I think about Winnipeg sewage. When I think agricultural or wetlands, I'm thinking of the province of Manitoba. Why did you decide to focus on the federal government for this paper? 
Uh, well, there's uh, some excitement at the federal level about water right now, and we've seen water feature in a number of commitments from our current federal government. So there is a commitment to continue action to protect the health of Lake Winnipeg. There has been a commitment to form a new federal agency to address water. And so we wanted to be sure that Lake Winnipeg was included in those federal conversations about water. And we will say that this is surely not everything that needs to be done for Lake Winnipeg, but it is where we think uh, the federal government can start. It's a bit of a, a cheat sheet, if you will, for some actions that can have immediate impact for the lake. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Daniel, I'm gonna bring you in. In the opening pages of this paper, which uh, co-authored by yourself and Alexis, you say we already have the tools in hand to achieve real impact for Lake Winnipeg. As we go through the rest of the hour, how important is this to keep in mind that what you're proposing isn't necessarily radical or new, it's just using the tools in our toolkit? Or is it radical that we are just using the tools in our toolkit? Can you speak to that? Yeah, it might actually be quite radical. I mean, when it comes down to it, I, I think uh, we talk about challenges that we see with water or really anything in the environment. And often uh, what we, the response we hear back is that, well, we need a new plan or we need a new study. Uh, we should commission something that will solve this problem. Uh, so we thought, oh, that's, that's interesting, but what about all the other commitments and things that we've already agreed to, uh, the federal government has already agreed to do and put some resources behind? Why not follow through on those? And that's where we wanted to start. Okay, great. And, and let's get started. Now, for those of you uh, joining us today, in the chat function, we will be noting each of the things, each of these five things as we discuss them. So if you want to look at them for reference or follow along, uh, they'll be there in the chat. Alexis, I'm going to start with you. Thing one, recognize phosphorus as the cause of blue-green algal blooms on Lake Winnipeg. Can you talk a little bit more about, about this thing, about this recommendation and how you see it being applied. Sure, yeah. So the Lake Winnipeg Foundation is focused on phosphorus as the most effective and efficient means of addressing the algal blooms that we see on the lake uh, that impact the lake's water quality. And this focus comes out of 50 years of research that was undertaken at the Experimental Lakes Area in Northwestern Ontario, now the IISD Experimental Lakes Area. But this research facility was initially established by the federal government in response to eutrophication concerns for Lake Erie. And it was mandated specifically to identify the causes, consequences, and controls of eutrophication. And so the research there has been conducted on whole ecosystems and gives us a really fulsome picture of what's happening. So uh, using that research, we're focused on reducing phosphorus to address algal blooms, and we see two immediate actions for the federal government. The first is to accept a recommendation from the International Joint Commission to set a phosphorus target in the Red River, which is contributing most of the phosphorus that Lake Winnipeg receives. And the second is to update the wastewater systems effluent regulations under the Fisheries Act to recognize the effects that phosphorus has on freshwater ecosystems. Okay, the wastewater systems effluent, it just rolls off the tongue. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so um, to, to get this conversation started, I'm gonna stay with you, Alexis. Um, if the scientific knowledge that's coming out of IISD ELA, this whole lake um, research facility, is there, how are we seeing it being applied? How has it been applied over the last few decades uh, in terms of you know, real world policies, real world actions or changes to, to maybe other freshwater lakes? Yeah, well, so it was that research was started to address the challenges in the Eastern Great Lakes and specifically Lake Erie. And as the findings emerged in the few, first few years pointing to phosphorus, there were federal policies and regulations enacted uh, to protect the Great Lakes, specifically to ensure that municipal treatment plants were removing phosphorus from sewage effluent and that industrial treatment plants were doing the same. And as a result of those changes, we saw an improvement in Lake Erie's water quality. Unfortunately, uh, Lake Erie still requires some effort and now um, decision makers there are focused on uh, non-point sources of phosphorus, so sources outside of urban areas, uh, but they're still focused on phosphorus to address this issue there. 
And if I can jump in, can you just give us the, the brief description of a point source versus a non-point source? Sure, yeah, absolutely. familiar with that? So a point source is phosphorus that all comes generally out of one pipe. It's a very localized source of phosphorus, uh, tends to come out of some piece of infrastructure like a sewage treatment plant, uh, but we can really pinpoint exactly where the phosphorus is coming from. A non-point source is a more diffuse and spread out source of phosphorus. So think about runoff from city streets, runoff from agricultural fields. Uh, it's hard to really pinpoint a specific spot where that's coming from, uh, though you can if you get down to a fine enough scale. But generally, we think about it as sort of diffuse across a larger landscape. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, Daniel, I think I'm going to bring you in here for a moment. Um, so. If phosphorus, phosphorus is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Can you, can you explain phosphorus as beneficial versus phosphorus as pollution and where we draw the line? Sure, uh, so phosphorus, we, we rightly talk about it as a nutrient because that's what plants and algae need to, to grow and live. Um, uh, but when it comes down to it, it's about balance. Uh, when we, what we see in our lakes is that if you add more and more and more phosphorus, uh, what you get is more more algae and, and eventually it kind of tips the scales into the point where uh, the fish and the other species in the lake can't really handle it um, and then you end up with these runaway algal blooms so that's a uh, kind of an example and we see that with fisheries right so obviously fish like lots of food uh, so you'd think adding more algae would be more food for those fish but it also can create problems and where those fish can't uh, uh, can't really adequately survive and we'll see uh, fish or lakes with lots of algae, you often have less fish. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah no, <clears throat> that makes sense. And it's, yeah, sort of counterintuitive sometimes you'd think, because yeah, algae is fish food, but too much of too much of a good thing, I guess, becomes a problem. Okay, um, well, let's let's move on because we want to make sure we've got lots of time for, for questions from, from those joining us. And again, if you do have a question, remember, you can ask it at any time throughout today's webinar um, using that Q&A function, and we'll, we'll take your questions a little bit later. Uh, Alexis, I'm going to come back to you uh, for thing two. <clears throat> so if you can walk us through this recommendation, use evidence to guarantee impact from every federal government dollar spent to reduce phosphorus loading to Lake Winnipeg. What does that mean? That means that we need to make sure our actions are evidence-based in order for them to be cost-effective and to have an impact on the ground. So we wanna be sure that the right evidence has been identified and is being collected to make decisions to improve water quality on Lake Winnipeg. Right now, many of the efforts that are undertaken at the federal level are funded through a program called the Lake Winnipeg Basin Program. That program is renewed in five year stages. So it's coming up for renewal in budget 2022. And we're of course recommending that the federal government renew that integral program that helps us in our efforts to protect Lake Winnipeg. We'd also like to see them strengthen accountability in the funding arrangements that occur under that program. So we can be sure that when the federal government is making an investment, it's translating into a change for the lake. And one of the best ways to do that is to target those investment investments in specific phosphorus hotspots or areas within the lake's larger watershed that are contributing a disproportionate amount of phosphorus. So if we want to reduce phosphorus, we have to know where the phosphorus is coming from and work to reduce it in those areas. Uh, the Lake Winnipeg Community Based Monitoring Network is a citizen science network that's specifically focused on identi identifying these phosphorus hotspots so we can target action there. And then once we've targeted action in the hotspots, we also have to evaluate it. So we have to look at the particular projects that are being funded and how effective they are at actually reducing phosphorus. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the answers for phosphorus reduction that are coming to us from warmer climates, hillier climates, so around Lake Erie, for example, they don't work the same once you implement them here in Manitoba. So we have to get a better handle on, on what works here, um, and then we have to do more of that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stick with you, Alexis, for some questions. Daniel, don't worry, you're not off the hook. I'm bringing you in in just a moment. Um, <clears throat> you talk about, I have, I have a couple of questions, but maybe I'll start here. You talk about investing money, investing where it will have an impact. Is there a danger to this? 
because researchers might go into a project not knowing the answer, right? They want to test their hypothesis. So is there a danger linking federal funding, federal investment in research? Um, are, you, are you limiting um, the, the innovation, let's say, of folks who want to test out things, um, test out new ideas in this Manitoba situation? Yeah, I think it's not a question of one or the other. Uh, we need both. We need ongoing research so that we better understand what the problem is and what the potential solutions are. But once we've identified a course of action, we need to then be sure that we're targeting our remedial action uh, where it is needed. So this is not to say uh, discontinue research for Lake Winnipeg, absolutely not. But we do know enough at this point to have identified phosphorus hotspots within the larger watershed and to have some sense of what actions need to be undertaken there. Okay, well, that was a really helpful segue into my next question, which is about these phos phosphorus hotspots. I'm gonna use the air quotes here, but yeah, essentially a term that's talking about these areas of land where, where we know more phosphorus is happening there. Um, why is it important to be focused and what you say we already know enough to get moving, what do we know? Give us the rundown on the Manitoba context, phosphorus hotspots, if you had the magic wand or the mm -hmm. wallet, uh, where are you putting the money? Okay, sure. Uh, well, we, t we hear a lot about uh, the size of the Lake Winnipeg watershed, right? We talk a lot about this enormous watershed, spans two countries, four provinces, four states, lots of people making decisions, lots of different activities. Everything we do in that landscape can impact the health of the lake. It's true, uh, but it makes the problem pretty hard to tackle, right? It creates this big intractable problem uh, and it doesn't give us, you know, handholds to figure out how to solve it. So the, the Lake Winnipeg Community-Based Monitoring Network is working at breaking down that big problem into small solvable chunks. And those are those phosphorus hotspots. So we're looking specifically um, within Manitoba at this point, and with a particular focus on the Red River watershed, because we know from government monitoring programs that the Red River watershed contributes 70% of the phosphorus for Lake Winnipeg. So that's where we've made sure to prioritize our citizen science efforts. Uh, but even within that, that breakdown of the Red River Valley, we're finding even smaller phosphorus hotspots within it. And those are the areas that require investment. Now you say citizen science efforts, what do you mean by that? Uh, well, uh, the Lake Winnipeg Community-Based Monitoring Network is a group of citizen volunteers and conservation partners across Manitoba. Uh, and essentially they're folks that live uh, or work near unique waterways that, um, that are difficult to sample from a centralized point. So rather than sending folks out from Winnipeg to sample across the watershed, we have folks stationed near these waters, their home waters, so to speak, who are able to get out and take a sample when it's most important to do so, which is when water levels peak, lots of flow is coming down our waterways and ultimately carrying phosphorus to Lake Winnipeg. Okay, so they're they're waiting by a red telephone, right? Go, go, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Push the button. <laughs> Deploy. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, let's move on. Daniel, I'm bringing you in now. Uh, thank you, Alexis. Again, a reminder, uh, you can ask questions on any of the things uh, at any time during this conversation. We'll, we'll get to them later. Please use the, the Q&A function for that. Daniel, thing three, can you summarize or walk us through this recommendation? Support Indigenous peoples in reclaiming and restoring their relationship with water. Sure. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, when it, when it comes down to it, uh, Indigenous people have, well, we, we have lived uh, around Lake Winnipeg um, since, uh, since the formation of the lake. And uh, we have a long, that's a long-term deep connection with, with the lake. And that's still practiced to this day. Uh, and, and when we think about things like rights and our, our, our role amongst, amongst the lake, it's, it really comes down to responsibilities. So for, so for First Nations and, and Indigenous nations, we, we really, peoples, we look at the lake um, and a lot of our uh, practices and ways of life uh, are really built around that. Uh, so for us, it was starting to look at how, what, what the role the federal government can have in supporting that, uh, supporting Indigenous peoples as they reclaim, reclaim that responsibility. 
Um, we saw that first uh, you could, uh, in the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous People, Peoples, that would be uh, a good place to start, that that should be implemented. That provides a framework of, of rights that uh, the Indigenous people can, are uh, unequivocally that Indigenous peoples would be responsible for taking care of, of water and, and the lake. Can I jump the, in? That, yes. that United Nations Declaration, has Canada signed on as a country to that? Can you give us a little background Absol on that? Absolutely. So Canada, so the, the, the declaration was first conceived of in the 1990s uh, and was brought before uh, all the countries in the world and everyone signed on except for uh, in back in 97. Uh, all the countries signed on except for Canada, the US, New Zealand, and Australia. They've since signed on. So, uh, and it's been just, just about 10 years now that uh, Canada signed on, but hasn't been able to implement in any um, major way. Uh, and the last thing that we want we want to see with this uh, with this recommendation is that uh, indigenous knowledge holders are supported uh, in terms of providing uh, decisions and directions towards Lake Winnipeg. And we can see that initially through uh, setting up a indigenous led task force that would uh, be responsible for helping with setting up a state of the lake reporting. Um, that, that's important because when we think of indigenous knowledge uh, and science, they are they can be very complementary, and by working together, uh, really fill gaps and also help lead each other in ways that can uh, get us at the real questions that need to be answered. Well, I want to jump in again. That's that sets me up for the question I wanted to ask you around this around this thing around this recommendation. I like the idea of, of complementary uh, working working together. Can you give us an example of of indigenous knowledge related to Lake Winnipeg. So, for folks who are who are coming to this term uh, relatively new, what what does that look like? What does it mean? I think most of us, have, when we think of traditional science, we have some ideas in our head of what that looks like. What does indigenous knowledge um, to Lake Winnipeg look like? Yeah. So, I think I think there's two examples that come to mind. Um, so one was when we had flooding in 2011 uh, around, uh, came over the, through Lake, Lake Manitoba, Lake St. Martin. Uh, that was a major flooding event that uh, ended up, you know, was done, was a decision by the province of Manitoba. And when that flooding happened, we saw uh, indigenous fishers talked about how uh, they saw a decline in whitefish. Uh, and were, their concern was that it was around spawning areas that were uh, in Lake St. Martin. Uh, just so they presented that, but at the time, and even currently, we don't have a good scientific understanding of what was happening with whitefish. And so as we go in to make new developments uh, without that Indigenous knowledge, we are potentially setting ourselves up for uh, more problems for those fish. Um, and then an another thing that uh, the indigenous elders were noticing um, changes on the lake uh, decades ago, uh, things that were a more subtle change as uh, more phosphorus was coming to lake, as erosion was happening due to uh, hydroelectric dams. Um, those changes were already starting to occur. And, it was, and if we'd started to listen to them earlier on, I think we would be farther ahead in solving the problems that we see today. Okay, thanks. Um, Alexis, I want to bring you in for a moment here. So Daniel mentioned that Indigenous knowledge and, and, and science can be complementary. What happens if they're not? What happens if Indigenous knowledge and science disagree on an issue? How do we move forward in a, in a constructive way then? I'm, I'm not sure that the goal is that they do agree all the time. Um, I don't think that's what we should be aiming for. Um, I think instead, we should be focused on making sure that we're using the right knowledge system to answer the specific question at hand. So both science and Indigenous knowledge have their unique strengths. Um, they can be very complementary, and it always is really interesting to explore those instances where they do agree. Uh, but certain questions will be best answered by one knowledge system or the other. And so uh, that requires a little bit of thinking to figure out the best, the best approach. Um, and then to, to commit to using that knowledge system to answer the question at hand. Okay. 
Uh, Daniel, I'm going to come back to you. And uh, I think we're going to move on. I see questions are coming in, so that's great. Um, we've got some, some questions to take later on in the hour. So let's talk about thing four. Let's talk about recommendation four. And Daniel, I'm going to let you talk to this. Increase enforcement of evidence-based policy and practices for freshwater health. Can you break that down for us? What, is, what does it look like and what are you hoping to achieve through this recommendation? Sure. When, when you look at environmental laws in, in this country or really anywhere in the world, um, they, they end up only being as good as they can be enforced. So if you, no matter how good a law you set up, if you don't actually have people adhere to it to do those things, then it, well, they aren't useful. Um, so we, we wanted to point you to a couple of things that were uh, consistently not being um, uh, adequately applied, I guess. So let me so get back get... to those tools in the toolbox thing that these, exactly. these exist. These, yeah. yeah, so just thinking of some of the things. So one was uh, aquatic invasive species. So uh, of course, we've now seen zebra mussels uh, come into Lake Winnipeg and, and, sp and spread uh, pretty rapidly. Uh, once, once they arrive, they're, they're, they are really impossible to get rid of. But we already had uh, rules and systems in place to help prevent that spread, uh, to prevent them from getting into the, the lake potentially. Uh, not to say it would have been a guarantee, but uh, there had been, uh, there had already been some thinking into how the province and the federal government could be working with the U.S., um, how they could develop pathways to figure out what, how to stop those uh, invasive species, and none of that work was done adequately. Um, Another example would be around the Fisheries Act. Uh, this is a long-standing act with a lot of a lot of powerful laws in it, including prevention of pollution. Um, but in the across the prairies, we've seen very few uh, registries into that uh, uh, into that act, which means that it's just not being enforced at the level it should be. Uh, and then finally, uh, and quite importantly, I, I mentioned the, the flood in 2011. So. Uh, those types of flood events are, are far too frequent in the Lake Winnipeg watershed. And one of the reasons uh, we see that is because of wetlands. Uh, so dra draining wetlands leads to more, more floods. And, and that's, a, that's a cost that's borne by the federal government. Uh, so we really see that there's a need for the federal government to work with the provinces who, who are in charge of this wetland drainage uh, to make sure that the, it's not causing these, this undue harm uh, and impacts. Okay. Um, I want to, where do I, where do I want to go? Daniel, I'm going to stay with you. Um, let's talk about, let's talk about zebra mussels. Um, I know it's something that a lot of citizens are, are keenly interested in. It's something um, I hear a lot about when I'm, you know, out and about, even just, you know, friends and family, you say you, you work for the Lake Winnipeg Foundation. They're like, hey, tell me about zebra mussels. Um, but zebra mussels are just one aquatic of invasive species. There are, there are other species Maybe this is an unfair question for you, Daniel, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Why do zebra mussels get all the get all the glory, get all the attention? How come we're not focused on other AIS or aquatic invasive species? Should we be? Is is one more more harmful in terms of consequence to Lake Winnipeg? What what's the deal with uh, zebra mussel attention to the to the exclusion of some of these other invasive species? Yeah, I, I mean, I think zebra mussels are a nuisance that uh, you are pretty quick. You're pretty quick to experience. So they they show up on beaches. They collect around uh, rocks and infrastructure on your boats. So in that way, they can be just in your face in a way that a lot of other aquatic invasive species aren't, unless you're paying attention to the ecosystem. So we have other uh, invasive. Uh, we have the uh, uh, spiny flea beetle. Or, Spiny water flea. Spiny water flea, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that has been a nuisance for some time, but it's really it more affects fish uh, and fishers than, than than say beachgoers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a bit of the squeaky wheel. It's in your face. It's noticeable, and that's why it, it's the it's now the poster child. They are the poster child of of AIS. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting, um, picking up what Alexis was talking about a little while ago about, you know, th this idea of the watershed being vast and how that can be sort of immobilizing for action. I guess in a way it, it's also applicable here though, because when we think about zebra mussels or any aquatic invasive species moving, they're moving across jurisdictions. So again, all the more reason why we need to have 
uh, evidence-based policy and practices that are that are collaborative. Um, I don't know if that's a question, but maybe an invitation to uh, to affirm that I'm right that you know when we're thinking about crossing borders, crossing from one lake to another, um, you know, into municipalities, into different provinces and territories. Yeah. Yeah, well, even if we think about zebra mussels, although we might not be able to get them out of Lake Winnipeg, um, there is you know, thousands of lakes uh, and waterways that we still we still don't want to spread zebra mussels into. Um, so that work on, is ongoing, and it needs it actually needs resources to be able to do that correctly. The ability to wash boats and 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 all and public education that is so, so important. But there are other invasive species that have the potential to come in as well. And so maintaining that monitoring, uh, working between the, the two different, the two countries is also very important. Another reason we really need the federal government to step up on that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, okay, Alexis, I wanna bring you in here. Um, this, this question goes out to the cynics joining us today. Uh, freshwater management. Ooh, it's a, I feel like it's a bit of a jurisdictional and regulatory nightmare. Um, the paper that you co-authored, this, this paper right here, you list 10 federal departments and agencies that are directly uh, mentioned in here. And then you've got all the other you know, regional agencies, First Nation governments. How realistic is it to expect multiple levels of government to play nice with each other and to actually you know, move forward on some of this evidence-based policy? Doesn't matter how realistic it is, I think it's imperative. It needs to be figured out. Um, we don't have the luxury to say it's too hard. Uh, it's, it's time to start tackling these hard problems. And um, I think we can, we can break them down into manageable chunks. We've, we've already identified the players, right? Our, our paper lays out the specific federal departments that hold these mandates or these responsibilities. Um, so we can't shy away from hard problems. And I think we also need to encourage governments to uh, work towards long-term solutions, which isn't always politically palatable, right? They, we have these election cycles of every four years and it's hard to, to take on something that might not show impact uh, immediately, but it's necessary. And when we're dealing with, with complex ecosystems, with, with interconnected problems, we really need to set ourselves up for success over the long term. Okay, noted. I, diplomatic, but also a call to action. I like it. Um, okay, we're going to move on. Daniel, I'm bringing you back in for this one. Um, this is our fifth and final thing. So I see questions continuing to come in. Again, another reminder that we'll be answering your questions a little bit later um, in the hour. Daniel, Walk us through thing five, fulfill jurisdictional responsibilities through concrete actions and strengthened accountability. What does that mean? Sure. Well, as Alexis just mentioned, this big watershed has a lot of players um, and, and that's no reason to just step away from the problem. Um, so, but, but luckily there is, there is systems in place. So one is the, uh, uh, there's a Canada-Manitoba Memorandum of Understanding respecting Lake Winnipeg and the Lake Winnipeg Water Basin. That's on the Once floor. again, just rolls off the tongue. Yeah. We call it the MOU around here. But um, yeah, so when we think of that, that's an agreement between Canada and Manitoba to work together to solve these problems. It's, uh, it's fairly broad and, uh, uh, and it's meant to be. Uh, we think uh, Indigenous signatories should be part of that process uh, and help inform uh, all the work, the cooperation, the accountability uh, that's needed to, to do that. Uh, we also see that there's a need for an action plan to look at Lake Winnipeg. Um, there's a similar action plan in uh, Lake Erie that uh, works between Canada and Ontario. So, and that helps support the two different activities in a more deliberate, specific way, uh, which is really needed. Of course, uh, you know, Lake Erie also hasn't brought in Indigenous nations as a Part of their process and that's something that they should be working on over there and we should make sure as part of our our action plan and then finally we also see that the need to recognize um, uh, indigenous people for um, uh, for the, 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 their jurisdiction in terms of indigenous protected and conserved areas 
Um, so there's a couple of projects happening around uh, Lake Winnipeg and that already exist in, in Canada as well. And um, we, the federal government should support those as, uh, as really effective ways to protect uh, water and uh, natural systems. Okay. I want to pick up right there uh, at the end of what you were just talking about, Indigenous protective and conserved areas. You said some do exist currently. How, how are they similar or different from, say, a federal park? Because that's where my mind goes, is, is sort of a, a federal responsibility to protect and conserve a, an area of land. Is that, am I on the right track? Or can you break down a little bit more about what an Indigenous protective and conserved area looks like in the real world? Sure. Well, one is they're all going to be quite different. So the, if you're direct having the direction of lo local Indigenous people, um, they're going to bring a, their knowledge and really specific understanding and relationship with that land. Um, but one important thing to think about with these parks uh, and conserved areas, or protected and conserved areas, is that they are thought of as uh, a land that's in relationship with the people. And so it's not necessarily to protect and preserve uh, aside from people as like a, a faraway wilderness, but something that is that is the people as, as much as anything. Um, and that's one of the reasons we see these things actually succeeding uh, around the world. The, the conservation goals for these parks are doing better than, um, I guess, uh, traditional uh, uh, park areas. Um, so in Canada, the sort of most famous one is in Haida Gwaii. Um, but that's, we also have West Coast. That's yeah, that's West mm -hmm. Coast. Uh, but we also have examples around Lake Winnipeg. Uh, Pamachunaki is a UNESCO World Heritage Site that was took ten years uh, for the for Poplar River and and Blood Vein and other First Nations to set up. Um, the Fisher River uh, Cree Nation has been working with the Canada Parks. Uh, and Wilderness Society to set up, uh, well, they've set up the Fisher Bay Park Reserve, but are continuing that work today. So there, there is examples that are ongoing. So. Okay, great. Alexis, I want to bring you in here. <clears throat> uh, thing five, recommendation five, talks explicitly about acknowledging Indigenous jurisdiction and self-determination. Again, what practically would this look like on the ground? What would Indigenous, what would acknowledging Indigenous jurisdiction and self-determination look like if we are succeeding in this? First of all, I think it's really important to be clear that Indigenous jurisdiction exists, whether Crown governments in Canada recognize it or not, right? So it's, it's not, it doesn't come into existence because the federal government has acknowledged it. It's there and it's inherent. Uh, but it helps a lot when governments in a nation-to-nation -nation relationship explicitly acknowledge each other's jurisdiction. So I think there are probably many different ways that this could happen and to try to apply a blanket solution across the country will be challenging. Um, certainly I think bringing UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People into Canadian legislation will go a long way towards helping that. But then I think we need to be very open to different models whereby the Canadian legal system and the Canadian legislative framework acknowledge Indigenous jurisdiction and also recognize that it, it is not dependent on Crown government's acknowledgement. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> I think we'll stop there um, because we want to make sure we have time to, to take you, the viewers, you, the participants questions. And speaking of you, the participants, I think before we head into our facilitated Q&A with your questions, uh, it's time for another poll. So you've heard these five things. You can see them in the chat. Having just encountered and listened to Alexis and Daniel walk us through each of these five things, which thing resonated most for you? Recognizing phosphorus as the cause of algal blooms, using evidence to guarantee impact from federal spending, supporting Indigenous peoples in reclaiming and restoring their relationship to water, increased enforcement of policies and practices, or fulfilling jurisdictional responsibilities. So I'll give just another moment or two for folks to answer. Remember, you're answering anonymously. And let's see from the crowd what thing resonated most for the folks joining us today. Okay, not a clear winner, but we do, we have, we have one, support Indigenous people in reclaiming and restoring their relationship with water. Thing three, ekes out a little bit ahead. 
Um, but there's generally some support across the board, which must be validating for the co-authors of the report sitting with us today. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, let's let's move on. Let's take some of your questions. I'm going to uh, get organized here with the questions and see what we've got here. I haven't been looking ahead of time. Um, okay. I've got a question here. Alexis, maybe I'll direct this to you from Dennis. He wants to know the total number of hotspots within the watershed. Can you, is that answerable? <laughs> where, or, or maybe where are we at in terms of understanding the, the causes of phosphorus and where we should be looking? Right, so um, I don't have an exact number. Um, and, and the most recent data that we've published through the Community-Based Monitoring Network is from 2019. Uh, you can look up that report on our website to find the red hotspots. Um, but we also don't have full coverage of the Manitoba portion of the, the Lake Winnipeg watershed yet, which is one of our goals, is to ensure that we're sampling at this subwatershed scale across Manitoba. Um, and we will find more uh, hotspots as we go. But so far, we have found a number of hotspots in the Red River Valley and uh, southeast of Winnipeg uh, specifically. We're hoping in the future to be able to combine our data with provincial and federal monitoring data to uh, understand what's happening right along the shores of the Red River, which are currently uh, blank spaces in our, in our hotspot map. Uh, but there are a number of clear hotspots that are emerging and that are hotspots year after year. So part of the value of this long-term monitoring data set is that we have multiple years of data. So we can see how things change from year to year, but we can also identify consistent patterns over time. Sure. And along that same, uh, same train of thought, uh, Dean is asking about the level of phosphorus in Lake Winnipeg. And is it, is it related to, can we tell yet, uh, is it related to the hog industry? I think Manitoba, I think hotspots in southeast Manitoba, and my, my, my brain wants to connect the dots. Um, yeah. I mean, agriculture is a phosphorus producer, uh, generally, whether we're talking about livestock or, or fertilizers. Um, how is community-based monitoring connecting those dots, or are we there yet? Can we, can we already make that link? That's where we're headed. So the, we like to say that the community-based monitoring network tells us where the phosphorus is coming from. And then we need the support and partnership of, of academic researchers, government researchers to really tease apart the what. So once we find a phosphorus hotspot, we are really excited to partner with researchers to do more detailed studies of what's the cause, right? So we can separate out municipal contributions from lagoons or treatment plants, and we can look at agriculture. Uh, we're hoping to get some good data on uh, what, what phosphorus is lost from manure spreading in Manitoba in order to better understand that. But certainly spatially, we're finding a lot of hot spots in areas of high livestock density. Okay. We're going to stay with community-based monitoring for a little bit yet. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure who I should direct this question to. Um, Doreen is wondering, will the Indigenous-led task force engage Indigenous people to assist with taking water samples? Uh, she thinks it makes a lot of sense, getting people directly involved to strengthen connection and commitment to change. Um, maybe I'll stay with Alexis right now. Um, the community-based monitoring that LWF is doing, um, are there Indigenous nations, Indigenous organizations currently doing, doing monitoring? Yeah, we, uh, we work with the Manitoba Métis Federation. So they have a number of their Métis citizen scientists involved in our program and helping to collect water samples. Um, I think it's important to recognize that there are many other concerns about water. Uh, we're focused on phosphorus, but many Indigenous nations uh, and Indigenous peoples around the lake have other concerns and are developing monitoring programs and guardian programs to identify those issues and uh, to speak to them. Okay. Daniel, did you want to jump in? I know I've been putting all the questions on Alexis here. Uh, Community-based monitoring is not necessarily something that the Lake Winnipeg Indigenous Collective is leading, but so I'm sure you're, you're, you're meeting and talking with lots of partners and, and folks who are doing this type of work as well. Sure. Yeah, well, the, the collective is taking a bit of a slightly different approach where we're trying to be a support for monitoring programs uh, that are being led by First Nations. Uh, but yeah, when it, 
thinking of the the task force, uh, that might not be the right the might right mode for that uh, task force, but I certainly those kinds of supports are are important, and and uh, we do see examples of them. So that's good to see. The Indigenous task force, I think, would be more uh, focused on Indigenous knowledge and how to support that. As uh, uh, it really comes down to a power imbalance. So science uh, has a lot of resources uh, and effort that's been put into it. Um, and for indigenous knowledge holders, uh, they, they they don't have as much uh, as much on hand to uh, kind of support themselves. So that that would be the big big part of what the task force would have to do. Sure. Okay. Now, Kathy, you asked a question here about uh, the Rat River and an animal farm runoff. I feel like Alexis, you sort of spoke to that. That yes, um, breaking down. Uh, I like the word granular, maybe because it's hot and new right now, but that granular level understanding of, of phosphorus. So the Rat River would be uh, one of the rivers that community-based monitoring is, is taking a look at as well, correct? It's not just, we talk about the Red River, but the Red River is where all of these other creeks and streams and rivers go. So the, the monitoring itself is happening all over the place in rural Manitoba, correct? Yeah, that's right. We, we talk about the Red River watershed, which is the area of land that drains into the Red River. Uh, but citizen scientists are sampling on all those smaller tributaries to break that area down into smaller segments. Okay. I've got a couple questions about zebra mussels. Does not surprise me at all, but we have some questions about zebra mussels. So um, Gus is wondering, since zebra mussels are filter feeders, right? So they these little mussels filter the water, would the proliferation of these zebra mussels in Lake Winnipeg eventually reduce the amount of algae on the lake? And before I let you answer that, I've got a uh, related question from Mike, who says he realizes that they're more in your face than other invasive species, but why is their impact on Lake Winnipeg something of concern? So I feel like both Gus and Mike are coming at this question from kind of the same viewpoint. We have these mussels in the lake, well, they're gonna eat all the algae, isn't that a good thing? But really, why are we concerned, particularly about zebra mussels' impact? Um, who wants to? Alexis, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to direct here. I'm going to sure. turn my keep and facilitate. Daniel, I'm not letting you off the hook, though. I'm going to bring you back in if you'd like as well. Yeah, I, I will fully say I'm not an expert on zebra mussels, but one, yes, absolutely, they're filter feeders, and we have heard a number of people reflect on how clear the water is in the lake now that they've arrived. You can see your toes when you wade out. Uh, but what the zebra mussels do is redistribute the nutrients and the productivity within the lake. So they're taking that algae out of the open water and they're actually redistributing it to the shores, the edges of the lake and the bottom of the lake. So we'll see different types of algae start to grow likely now along the near shore zone. And unfortunately, zebra mussels uh, are preferentially avoiding the, the bad algae, right? The, the algae that we're all concerned about, they know not to, not to eat it either. So we will see shifts in the algal communities towards uh, perhaps a, a increasing dominance of the blue-green algae and uh, more algae now showing up where humans use the lake, where we interact with the lake on the, in the near shore, on the edge of our beaches, at the end of our, our, our cottage lots. Yeah, and that's actually a good point that uh, that I'm glad you raised, Alexis, is that there are many different types of algae in the lake, and and some of it we want in the lake. Back to we talked at the very beginning of this conversation about you know being um, part of that food web that fish can eat, um, but there are certain types of algae that we're seeing more of in the lake, and that that is what we are concerned about. Yeah, Daniel, did you want to jump in on on zebra mussels, on their effects, on why? why there is a, a level of concern about this particular species? Sure, yeah, I think I'm really just adding on to what Alexa said, but there is, even with the clarity, there is still algae and we see that in uh, lakes like Lake, Lake Erie that has had both, uh, continues to have uh, algal blooms as well as having had zebra mussels. Um, uh, so it doesn't, yeah, just doesn't get rid of it. We, and I, I think it partly comes down to a balance question again. Um, so when you start, when you add something new to an environment that grows so fast, uh, it's going to change a lot of things. And part of part of part of that is that we just don't know what's going to happen. Will will fish be able to eat? Uh, what what services did other uh, mussels provide that are now going to be pushed out? Um, what kind of plants will grow? All that will change, and uh, and it won't necessarily be for the worse, but it also probably won't be for the better. 
Sure. Okay. Um, okay. This is a nice meaty question from Julian. Um, they want to know, do you ever see phosphorus capture or reductions move from the public sphere to the private industry through things like phosphorus credits in water quality trade networks? So when we're thinking about solutions, how innovative and do we want to get? Can we talk about phosphorus credits and water quality trading? Uh, does anyone want to, to take that to take that question. I mean, we're focused on phosphorus reduction. Is that at this point a viable solution or is that something that's still a little bit academic? Well, Daniel, yeah. I, I can talk to water quality trading a little bit. I'm not uh, uh, an expert yet, although I can see that there's a need to start to think about it more. Um, yeah, the way I would look at it is that you have, when you have water uh, and you're making trades, um, unlike air, uh, that water is in a place, right? And even though it moves and it's connected between areas and will eventually support the health of Lake Winnipeg, the rest of the watershed uh, could really suffer if you're concentrating your pollution in one area versus another. Um, yeah, it's, it still remains connected. Um, and then historically with, when we see decisions made on who, who has to bear uh, pollution downriver, uh, it tends to be uh, people of color. And it tends to be uh, done on a racial level that uh, Indigenous communities will would uh, have suffered from that kind of decision making in the past. Uh, and we could see water quality trading continuing that uh, tradition. Okay. Um, here's an interesting question from Susan. Has there been any consideration to the case of, to making the case for legal action against, uh, she says, the three levels of government for damages or lack of protection. And she's thinking of a, a river in New Zealand where they used the courts, they used legal action. Um, Daniel, I'm going to go back to, I'm going to go back to you. And Alexis, if you want to jump in later, you can. Um, carrot versus stick. Should we be, should we be taking governments to court? Enough is enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think that governments do need to show some responsibility. Uh, I, I do get tired of passing the buck and, and thinking it's someone else's problem. It's complex. All the excuses we hear, uh, it does yeah, it does have to be addressed. So, and if that comes down to legal action, I think that the, why wouldn't we use the tools that we have in our pocket? Um, I, but I did want to mention, it sounds like she's referring to the legal personhood of the Wananui River in the New Zealand, uh, in New Zealand Maori uh, islands. And uh, that was something that was done by, by the Maori to, to protect their river. And it was one of the ways they saw translating their, um, their view of the river as uh, really an integrated part of themselves. Uh, and we're tired of seeing the, that kind of pollution and mistreatment of the, the river because it was them. That is them. Uh, so getting a, a recognition of legal personhood was one of the ways they saw that they could do that. Uh, Potentially, it's something we could look at here. Interesting. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward because the the people are the the gates have opened here, so the <laughs> questions are coming. This is great. Uh, and if we can't get to all of your questions, um, you can email us after the fact. We're happy to follow up with you later. Um, where was oh, I wanted to pick up a question from Jim here? How many good or bad species of algae are there? What makes the good ones good and the bad ones bad? So I'm the lay person on this call, and uh, I'm going to say hundreds of species of algae. And I know cyanobacteria, aka blue green algae, is the bad of the bad. But maybe I'll throw to you, Alexis. What what do we know about algae? The good, the bad, and the ugly. I I think this comes back to something Daniel said many times is it's all about balance, right? So algae isn't inherently good or bad. It has to do with how we view it and how we interact with it and how it impacts uh, our priorities of, around water use and water protection. Um, all generally a, a diverse community of algae is, is an indication of a healthy ecosystem. And so we wanna maintain that balance where multiple species are present and we're not shifting towards uh, a community that's dominated by by one type. And it is, I am correct that there are hundreds of, of different species of algae in Lake Winnipeg currently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
Jessica's asking if there's concern regarding other nutrients and not just phosphorus overloading in Lake Winnipeg. I think this is a, a good question. Uh, I mean, they're all good questions. I, sh <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't pick. But again, when you think of balance and you think of lake ecology, um, obviously there are many factors at play. It seems like that's a bit of a theme happening this call. Um, are there other nutrients of concern? Are there other people focusing on them? And why aren't we here? Why aren't mm -hmm. the Lake Winnipeg Foundation? Uh, Alexis, you want to jump in? and? Yeah. So I think in an ideal world where we face no limits, we would try to keep everything out of our waterways, everything human generated. Um, unfortunately, we don't live in that ideal world. We have timeline pressures. We have budget pressures. We have political pressures. So the Lake Winnipeg Foundation has focused on phosphorus to improve water quality because it's been demonstrated to have uh, an impact. Many people wonder about nitrogen reduction uh, and the science behind the effect that nitrogen reduction would have on water quality remains controversial. Uh, studies have shown that you can reduce nitrogen to zero, so no excess extra nitrogen going into the system and it has no effect on algal blooms. So in situations where we have limited funds, uh, limited capacity to deliver on projects, we need to focus on, on things that we know uh, are winners from the start. Um, and once we get those, those solved, absolutely, we should broaden our scope and start to look at other impacts. Uh, but in, in Manitoba, we've spent 20 years trying to reduce both phosphorus and nitrogen through regulation and legislation, and we haven't achieved either. So it's, it's time to focus and it's time to invest in the solution we know will have an impact. Sure. And, and as you say, focus on, on the consequence. We've got a lake here that is really struggling and we know what the cause of that struggle is. So, so focus there. Okay. Um, let's see if I can get a few more in before we run out of time. Dennis is wondering, is Lake Manitoba and Lake Winnipegosis included in the Lake Winnipeg Foundation structure? So we have Lake Winnipeg in our name. Are we focused only on Lake Winnipeg or are efforts broadening beyond that? Um, I, I would like to think we're a freshwater organization. Um, there's, a, there's a great quote in this report about Lake Winnipeg being the canary in the coal mine. Um, Alexis, maybe I'll invite you to sort of speak to why why, when we talk about fresh water across the prairies or across Canada, why do we keep coming back? What makes Lake Winnipeg special? I think, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a beloved lake, um, but yes, as you say, it's, it's a canary for how we treat all of our lakes and rivers. So Lake Winnipeg being at the very bottom of the water basin will show impacts that we absolutely need to expect will start to appear on other lakes across the watershed. So if we can't figure it out, for Lake Winnipeg, we will see those impacts spread. In fact, we already are. There are algal blooms in lakes across Manitoba, across the prairies, across North America. It is not a, uh, a unique to Lake Winnipeg issue. It's something we're going to have to tackle across the continent. Sure. Um, Susan, you're asking about, is there a map showing hotspots? I can take that. Yes, lakewinnipegfoundation.org. Uh, if you find our Lake Winnipeg community-based monitoring network page there, we do print uh, reports after every field season and we are um, sharing maps. So sort of visualizing those hotspots. I think we have time for just one more. Um, what am I gonna pick? Uh, Emily's got a question here. What can we as citizens do to, she says to help the LWF, but I'm, I'm gonna change it up a little bit if I can, Emily. What can a citizen do, people who are attending this call who have learned something and now wanna apply what they've learned? Daniel, what's something someone can do today when, they, when we end this call? And you have to keep it 30 seconds or less. <laughs> Cause we're ending this call real soon. <laughs> yeah, 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 fair enough. Um, oh, geez. Um, well, I, I'd say we, there needs to be some political pressure here. Uh, right now, there is uh, decisions being made about the uh, Lake Winnipeg Basin Program, uh, about uh, how we manage water and coming from the federal government. Uh, and you should be contacting your MPs to make sure that they know that uh, you care. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Alexis, we're, we're out of time. Um, I want to thank, uh, thank you all for your great questions, everybody. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, you can email us, info at lakewinnipegfoundation.org, and we will do our best to follow up with you. 
Um, I want to thank you for joining us. I want to thank Alexis and Daniel for, for being part of this call, for, for writing this report. If you would like a hard copy of this report, you can also email us and we will mail one out to you. It goes over everything in a lot more detail. I counted, there were 62 footnotes in this bad boy. Um, I hope you found today informative. I hope you found it inspiring. Um, a reminder, again, if you want to learn anything more about the foundation, lakewinnipegfoundation.org. If you'd like to learn more about the collective, lwic.org. Uh, and again, we'll be sending out that short feedback survey. So thank you for, for attending today's webinar. I hope you stay safe. And on behalf of all of us, happy World Water Day.